Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, bienvenue. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon for a discussion on the future of academic collaboration in Europe, entitled Competition versus Cooperation in Times of Crisis, Reimagining European Collaborations. Um, our discussion today will focus on how European university cooperation has evolved and is evolving in a volatile geopolitical context, uh, what we might anticipate from the future and how we can preserve and maintain international cooperation in these uncertain times. Uh, my name is Lucy Shackleton. I'm head of public policy and partnerships at UCL European Institute uh, and in a previous life head of European engagement for Universities UK. So I'm delighted to be discussing and sharing this uh, event with you this afternoon on a topic very close to my heart. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be co-organizing this event with the French Embassy in the United Kingdom and with the Council in France. I'm going to hand over in just a moment for more formal introductions uh, from both Dr. Minha Sam and Dr. Catherine Sarako. Um, but just while, while we're waiting, a couple of short housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, our discussion will last about an hour and a half, so uh, up until about 5.30 UK time. Uh, our first speaker, Professor Alain Berretz, who I will formally introduce in a moment, is joining us remotely uh, with the rest of our speakers here in the UK. Um, uh, I'll ask both Professor Berretz and Dr. Uwe Steiger to uh, give 15 minutes worth of remarks uh, before asking uh, Dr. Vincent Carpentier and uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Christine Musselin to uh, respond uh, also on the basis of their rich academic expertise in this area. Um, I'd encourage you to ask questions. Uh, for those of you joining online, please do use the uh, Q&A function, not the chat. Um, uh, and you're also very welcome to use the tweet using the organizational Twitter handles that we displayed uh, earlier on. Um, in the interim, just to note that this session is being recorded and will be made available uh, via the UCL European Institute website in the next couple of days. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over first to Dr. Catherine Sarako from the British Council in France for a brief introduction and then to Dr. Minha Fan. Thank you, Lucy. So good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen, according to where you are. A warm and huge welcome to all the community and to all the colleagues from higher education and also to those who are joining online. So before we kick off, as it was reminded, uh, some practical reminders. We have a Twitter handle, which is at UCL underscore EI. The session is being recorded and participants can ask questions live via the Q&A function on Zoom. I'm Catherine Saracco, Head of Education at the British Council of France, and I'm truly delighted to introduce the part two of our ambassade on the new geopolitics of higher education and research with my colleague Mina Pham, scientific counselor at the French Embassy. From the very beginning, the policy dialogues are so-called flagship programs at the British Council of France and have always been held in partnerships with key British academic partners, such as University of London Campus of Paris in 21. And I'm very happy that we could partner with the UCL European Institute on this relevant and timely topic on the future of European academic collaboration in times of crisis. So big thank you to UCL for hosting this event and also to the organizers, Lucy Shackleton and Uta Steiger, but also to my colleagues from the Department for Science and Technology at the French Embassy, Mina Pham, Florence Ferrand, Damien Vial, who have been very instrumental in the conception and organization of these ambassadors. Before diving very briefly into the topic, I'd like to outline that we have been running this series of policy dialogues for four years now on key higher education topics, as always with the same ambition to stimulate the debate, to exchange best practices and to bolster institutional ties for sustainable partnerships between France and the UK, but also beyond. We have worked twice with PSL, Paris Sciences et Lettres, and I do recall a very constructive debate we had in 2020 on the role of universities in fulfilling the SDGs. We have worked also with ESAM University on youth employability and the future of work, and lastly with Sciences Po Paris on this series. 
This subject on the new geopolitics of higher education has become paramount in a tense international context. This issue is wide ranging and multifaceted. That's the reason why we use the plural les nouvelles géopolitiques de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche, as obviously there are several geopolitical issues arising that reshuffle the cards and completely reorganize the dynamics of science diplomacy. So I think we all assume that it will be an ongoing conversation moving forward. On February 24, we launched the part one with Sciences Po Paris by focusing on the Sino-American rivalry and its impact on student mobility and scientific collaboration. We touched on academic and technological sovereignty and the fundamental values that must be preserved, citizenship, plurality of opinions, democracy, autonomy, and open sciences. The question around competition versus cooperation was already brought to the fore. And one of the main conclusions was that since a global science has emerged as a system beyond the states themselves, efforts and strategies should be geared towards cooperation. Today, we are looking at European academic collaborations, their place, impact, and strategies compared to big players like the US and China, but also their role in Europe where political tension have surfaced. We are also facing unprecedented societal challenges, climate change, of course, technological sovereignty, gender equality, health and well-being, misinformation, and many others, which untackled could create additional divides. Many issues will be discussed today, in particular, the European University Initiative, which since 2019 is a real game changer in bringing together European universities sharing the same values and ambitions and being test beds for transnational cooperation. I'd like now to conclude by saying that in times of geopolitical tensions, there is a heightened need for international academic collaboration, which is critical to tackle common challenges. European alliances have definitely a huge part to play and their underpinning training, research, innovation model is very promising, even though there are still challenges around common governance structures joint European degrees, accreditation, etc. I'm sure that our panelists today will contribute to a fruitful debate and provide us with key insights on this question. Among them, I'd like to highlight three which are particularly sensitive. Are we heading towards the EU strategic autonomy? And if so, how is that going to play out with global science? What will be the effect on international cooperation? Will academic freedom be curbed? And how will scientific diplomacy evolve? I shall end here my introduction. And on behalf of the British Council, I'm really delighted to open the floor to the discussion today. And without further ado, I hand over to Mina Pham. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Catherine, for this, uh, this few words of introduction. So myself, uh, my name is Mina Pham. I'm the uh, current counselor for science and technology at the French Embassy in London. And as it has been said, the topic of this meeting is particularly timely, especially as French representatives, since we all know, you all know that the French presidency of the EU Council at the moment is uh, President Macron. And also, I would like to remind you that France and Germany have initiated the creation of the alliances of European universities. And of course, we will probably discuss about it uh, in a few moments. But today, in the context of post-Brexit, the future of these consortia and more generally of collaboration, academic collaboration between French and British universities is questioned in terms of the partnerships. As the Department of Science and Technology of the French Embassy, we are especially concerned 
by keeping our bilateral and European research collaborations running. And it's very reassuring to see that in all our discussions with either French or British academic partners, there is a strong will to keep on work to keep on working together. And UCL is among these partners. Now the challenge is to find the right tools and the appropriate funding schemes to support this collaboration at the national, European, and international levels. One of the first steps to face this situation and its impact on higher education and research collaboration is to analyze the opportunities and constraints. And today's conversation will allow to hear from experts in higher education research and research, European and international collaboration, including in these times of crisis. I would like to value the excellent <coughs> partnership we have with, with our partner, the British Council, here represented by Catherine, not only in the organization of such dialogue, but also for other joint schemes and strategic thoughts about the future of collaboration in our joint, uh, common field. I would like also to acknowledge the partnership we build with UCL European Institutes for this event, but not only, and especially to Lucy Shackleton, who has been instrumental to prepare and host this meeting. And I would like to associate my team at the Higher Education Research and Innovation Department, Florence, uh, Florence Ferrand, Damien Vial, and also Elise Martin, who strongly committed themselves in the organization of this event. Finally, I would like to warmly thank our experts from France, Alain Behetz, coming soon, uh, Christine Musla, and also from UCL, who will share their views, sorry, UCL with uh, Uta Steiger and uh, Vincent Carpentier, uh, who will share their views in a moment. So uh, with further ado, I give you back the floor, Lucy. Thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to pass straight over to Professor Alain Berretz, who is, uh, of course, president of the Cost Association, which many of you will know very well. Um, and it couldn't be a better person, I think, to understand and unpick the challenges and opportunities facing European higher education today. Um, briefly, Professor Alain Berretz was elected president of the Cost Association in June 2021. From 2018 to 2020, he was also the special envoy of the French Prime Minister on the European Universities Initiative. Um, from September 2016 to September 2018, he was Director General of uh, Research and Innovation at the French Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation. Uh, and prior to this, he was both the President of the University of Strasbourg, as well as the Chair of the League of European Research Universities, which of course UCL is also a member of. Uh, he's also a Professor Emeritus at the University of Strasbourg. Uh, professor Bernetz, thank you again for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, hello, everybody. And first, my apologies for not being physically with you. I would have really loved to be back at UCL, but just couldn't make it. But uh, let's do it some other time. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you to the British Council, to the French Embassy, and of course, to the to the to UCL and the Europe Center at UCL for this honor. So I've been given uh, 15 minutes to speak to you about uh, the re-imaging uh, academic cooperation in those times of crisis. Of course, it will be not a complete view. Uh, it will be a very personal one. And I hope also that I can fuel uh, the discussion that will happen uh, later this afternoon or, uh, or tomorrow. In this period, I will take maybe uh, three examples coming actually from uh, my own uh, experience in, in the University of Strasbourg. Let me just get my text back on, on the screen. It will be easier for me. Um, and it will bring me, I guess, maybe two, three milestones. The University of Strasbourg was created, it's not as old as many British universities. It was created in the 16th century and was part of the fantastic intellectual movement of the Rhine Valley uh, during the Renaissance. Uh, Rhine Valley from Basel all the way up uh, to Amsterdam. And Erasmus was a, co a very uh, common host at the University of Strasbourg. What I want to point out is that at that time already, no students nor professors were ever staying in the same university. Uh, and so my first milestone is there. Uh, a university really lives through its international networks. Now, the second milestone goes two centuries, three centuries later, 1871, when France lost the Prussian War, 
Alsace and its capital Strasbourg became German and became as a part of a German, German empire actually for 50 years. And to show its power to celebrate its, uh, its victory, the German Kaiser, uh, to show how, how better it, the, the, the Reich was than France, uh, what, did, what did the German Kaiser do? He built a university in Strasbourg. It was the only imperial university outside of Berlin. He hired the best young scientists from all Germany. He put a lot of his personal money in, in the pot. And this led to more than 10 Nobel Prizes in 50 years. And so my second milestone is clearly a university, a university can be a political beacon, but it should not compromise on academic quality. And my third milestone is a, more than a century later, 1989, uh, so 33 years ago already. Uh, it was a date of founding of uh, the European Confeder Confederation of Upper Rhine Universities that we call ECOR. Uh, the, the, the members are universities of Basel, of Freiburg and Karlsruhe, and of Mulhouse and Basel, and Mulhouse and Strasbourg, sorry. And in 2013, we voted the creation of a quote, European campus. It was inaugurated by Carlos Moedas in 2016. Carlos was at the time the uh, commissioner for, for research. This milestone is there to show that university can indeed decide to build new bridges. Uh, in our case on the River Rhine, but the River Rhine is very symbolic because it was, it was still showing the scars of past bloody conflicts. And so it comes back also to the spirit of Erasmus. Why did I want maybe to, to, to speak about those three anecdotes? I, I merely wanted to stress three points which are important in your goal today, reimagining European academic cooperation. The first is that uh, we have lessons from the past to take. I will cite Marc Bloch, is a famous alumni from our university, and he said in French, l'incompréhension du présent n'est fatalement de l'ignorance du passé, which could be possibly translated as the misunderstanding of the present is surely born of ignorance of the past. The second one, second lesson is that bottom-up dynamics are fruitful. When we call this transnational network the European campus, we were fueled by a profound and sincere Euro European spirit, but we did not suspect that this, this could spark other initiatives. And the third lesson is that, although we all cherish academic freedom, we have to realize that universities are in the real world and they are also submitted to political issues. So if we want to succeed in our academic enterprises, we cannot ignore those political issues. I will try to illustrate these points with two examples, the European universities and uh, then the, the threat of sovereignty policy, policies on universities. So first, uh, European universities. The, you will have a special session on this tomorrow, so consider this also maybe as a small introduction. And I will, of course, not cover uh, the, the whole field, which is quite complex. The concept of European university is not new, but there was a turning point in the speech of Emmanuel Macron in the Sorbonne in 2017. This subject of European universities was tiny in the speech, uh, a few sentences in an hour and a half of speech, but it had a fantastic impact, probably because this vision was embedded into a more ambitious European agenda. The European universities alliances are now taken as a proxy of innovative international collaboration. I want to ask the question, is this really true? And I will try just to point out a few challenges that the concept is facing, and you can discuss this this afternoon or tomorrow. Let, let's, let's cut the, the notion in pieces. First, in European universities, what does the word universities mean? A university, any university works on three legs, research, education, and service to society, which includes innovation. Otherwise, it can be a research organization or higher education in, a, institution, but it's not a university. However, at present, the European universities alliances are totally limping because they only work on the education leg. If we just 
cut the word again, what is European in a European university? First, is it one global supranational university? In other words, is it a change of scale? Or two, is it a place to develop new functions and strategies which are not available to national universities? In other words, is it a change of purpose? Well, maybe it's a mixture of these two. Anyway, a successful European university should be different. Different in scale, different in depth, different in quality, and different in achievements. Then, what is a European University Alliance? What does this alliance mean? Remember that in the beginning, they were called networks, not alliances. But these clusters of universities are not networks. A network is used for communication. An alliance brings added value. You do together things that you could not do alone. The whole is more than the sum of the parts. A European university should bring academic and political value added compared to a national university system, just like the ERC is doing for research. Well, of course, there are many open questions which can be raised on the concept of European universities. These issues are not specific to the European universities, but actually apply to all academic cooperation, so they deserve to be shortly cited now. First issue, the issue of diversity versus top-down planning. You do not program, you know that, you don't program universities top-down. You provide them to your, with tools and then you let them work. And the EU program has up to now shown a high degree of uh, creativity from the stakeholders. It is critical to let them continue to build on that. We have to invest trust on, in universities as much as money. The other issue is the, the issue of sustainable funding versus calls for projects. Up to now, it's a call for project. Many EU uh, European universities have asked for some kind of sustainable funding. And this is an important issue, but it cannot be achieved without clear commitments from the member states, not just uh, the European Union. There is also the issue of excellence versus widening. There is a great challenge to consider both excellence and widening at the same time. And probably uh, the European universities could uh, go for what I often call inclusive excellence. But we really also have to consider the um, non-politically correct creation of world-class, excellent European universities. Finally, we do not stress enough the political importance of European universities alliances. Because I believe, and from the history, from the Middle Age, from the Renaissance, uh, universities were historically a building block of Europe. European universities alliances are not a goal for academics alone. They should also become a cornerstone for the building of the future of Europe. And European universities are a challenge for Europe, but also for the, for the member states. One cannot expect that Europe brings all the value added and all the money, by the way. Saying more bluntly, European universities cannot be the cure for the failure of, of some member states to build modern universities. It would only be, as we say in French, a band-aid on a wooden leg. This is a free translation, but I hope you will understand what I mean. Now, I will go quickly to my second and last point, the impact of politics on academic cooperation. We are really living in special times, the climate crisis, the war in Ukraine, the pandemic, etc. And this of all fits with the famous quote of Lenin that you know very well, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. In the history of universities, we have often looked down at political issues, putting forward the assumption that universities should not be directly dependent on political issues. However, the war in Ukraine shows that we are part of the game, both as citizens and academics. When the Russian war effort is backed by Russian academic institutions, we cannot just stand still. But we also know that many academics and students oppose the war and that international relationships are vital for them. There is a strong debate on this matter. I, don't, I won't have time to summarize it. My only point here 
is that academics cannot just consider that this is not an issue. I can remind a British audience of a quote I found by Winston Churchill uh, that he said in 1923, and I quote, there is always a strong case for doing nothing, especially for doing nothing yourself. So let's not do this. Uh, if universities want to prove that they are major actors of European, Europe's future, they should accept to be actors of European politics, but, but with their own tools and specific values. The European Council uh, meeting in March has set key policy targets for Europe, bolstering defense capacities, reducing dependence on energy from elsewhere, building a more robust economy base. And the word sovereignty is on top of the list. Now, will this quest for autonomy have an impact on research and innovation? Will ideas and persons cir circulate as well as before? One positive consequence of this attitude could be that Europe would consider that one of the main tools to achieve this autonomy, this independence, this sovereignty, is higher education and research. For this, they should increase significantly the investment in these fields. Unfortunately, we don't see it coming. So there is a more pessimistic, pessimistic point of view that we, if there is no budget increase, this new policy, policy the, the, the policies, the, the priorities of this new policy will come at the detriment of existing commitments. Uh, in this scenario, there is a big risk, for example, for blue sky research or non-technological non domains. But more generally, what will be the effects on academic cooperation? Will strategic priorities conflict with open science? Will more research and innovation activities find themselves subject to export control regulations? Will academic diplomacy still exist? Will academic freedom be, be curbed? Well, maybe it's time to remember the spirit of the Kaiser when he created the Imperial University in Strasbourg. He invested in universities for the future. He did not try to plan the future. In a con as a conclusion, I want to come back to the, another speech by Macron. I'm not speaking for Macron, be reassured, but I think he spoke a lot about Europe com compared to other French leaders, by the way. Uh, in Strasbourg, one week ago exactly, a pragmatic Macron called for the creation of a European political community to allow European nations to find a new space for cooperation. Uh, he said that the Ukraine crisis uh, has demonstrated that we need a wider circle and they cited the number of 35 members. The, the, this debate on a multi-tiered Europe has been going on for decades. Coalitions of the willing could be formed around different policy areas, including higher education and research. However, we should acknowledge the usual problems associated with this type of issues, a kind of Europe à la carte, or the creation of second class memberships, etc. And of course, some areas cannot afford compromise or disunity, for example, in the case of Europe's international standing. This multi-tiered approach is worth considering in the academic field. This is already the case for at least two institutions that I know of. The Council of Europe, which is also in Strasbourg, by the way, with its 46 members and dealing a lot with academic issues. And the other one is COST, which I'm presiding at the moment, funded by the EU, but spans to the limits of Europe with 40 members. To conclude, I really want to say I'm, I'm a European optimist. I, I strongly believe that your universities have been and will be a major building block for a um, strong Europe. However, neither in the State of Union speech by uh, President uh, Ursula von der Leyen, nor in the Sermon de Strasbourg speech by Emmanuel Macron last week, there is not the single time a word, the word university in those two major speeches, not a single time. Even if they have insisted on progress on research and technology using the COVID vaccine as an example, but this is yielding a very utilitarian view for our university. So let me conclude with a sentence by Robert Schumann from, the, from 1950. I quote, world peace cannot be safeguarded without the making of creative efforts proportionate to the dangers which threaten it. The contribution which an organized and living Europe can bring to civilization is indispensable to the maintenance of peaceful relations, end of quote. 
these prophetic words have become reality, but they sound a little bit strange in the current dramatic European situation. I am personally convinced that universities can be one of the main tools to achieve Robert Schumann's view and goal, but we still have a long way to go. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed for that fascinating set of insights. I'm going to pass the floor directly to my colleague, Dr. Uta Steiger, who is both executive director of the UCL European Institute, but also the Vice Provost at UCL for Europe, a strategic position shaping the university's engagement with the continent. Um, her academic research sits at the intersection of modern European thought, culture, and politics with her most recent open access edited volume, Brexit and Beyond, Rethinking the Futures of Europe, the press's second most access to publication. Uh, Uta is also the, a member of the Russell Group EU Advisory Board uh, and the Advisory Board of the Scottish Council on European Relations, a senior fellow at the Centre of Britain and Europe at the University of Sussex and a fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts. Uta, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Lucy, and um, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, a bit of a daunting task to follow um, that, that, that wonderful first uh, opener, uh, particularly the, uh, the spread of historical references and, and quotes, which I'm afraid I may not be able to quite match. Um, but as you heard just from very, very briefly from Lucy's um, introduction, as you can see, um, professionally, I have sort of Europe written all over me and, and personally too, I suppose, my uh, family of four owns a total of 10 passports from three European nationalities, and we speak four European languages to each other. So in many ways, you could say I have a, a very significant interest in everything that's Europe, but uh, if you're less kind, you'd say I have a vested interest too. So today is a very um, apt occasion for me to talk about um, that intersection of the personal and the professional um, that Europe represents for me. Now, all of you have um, enough background and, and expertise in the topic, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So I'm not going to try and convince you of the, the merits um, and the importance of cross-border collaboration in the sciences in, in Europe. Um, we all are aware just how much positive impact it brings both on the quality, the reach and impact of, of research, um, how it supports both the status and the productivity often of the mobile researcher, and the career prospects, as well as personal um, um, development of, of our students. Um, so I'm not going to cite all of that at you. I think we're all agreed in principle on this. Um, but I think um, what we have seen is that despite uh, international research collaboration in Europe really thriving and governments um, and transnational organizations and funders uh, recognizing the importance, uh, the challenges that we're facing at the moment and maybe probably since the last five years at the very least um, uh, are very uh, a sort of substantial indeed and I think it's worth um, looking in some more detail at this. And I think the header of today around collaboration versus competition gives us a very good um, angle on this. So I want to very briefly sketch where we are now. As you know, I um, just heard I have an interest in Brexit matters as part of my, my job to help the university prepare for it. But also if I speak here as um, on behalf of a UK university, it is obviously um, an overriding issue for us how the future of academic collaboration with um, the EU member states um, will look like um, going forward. Um, so within the context of a really budding and flowering um, international research collaboration, Europe is, remains, and um, uh, in fact, the largest and fastest growing of our partners to, to the UK, to UK universities. So scientifically, it is the continent, the region we work with most, if I now separate us out in some ways. Um, more than a third of uh, UK research papers are actually co-authored um, with other EU and associated countries, um, compared with only about 17.5% for the USA. And interestingly, so those of you who followed Brexit matters, on the trade issue as well, in trade, it tends to be said that geographical proximity is a huge matter um, for the prospects of, of further um, trade integration. And I suppose for research, some um, argument can be made for that as well. 
at UCL, you could say that um, Europe is really part of our DNA, quite literally. We have um, over 2,000 European collaborative partners, over 3,000 of our staff are European citizens, and over 6,000 of them um, of our students are so too. We've got some of the highest number of um, European students among our cohorts. And we really have been throughout those past few years very vocally active in trying to maintain and deepen our links to um, European uh, higher education institutions um, and obviously further abroad, despite um, the challenges thrown at us. Um, without sort of um, singing our praises too much, but it's true that the UK sector as a whole did extremely well under Horizon um, 2020 just as the other country, uh, Switzerland, and uh, the third country currently outside the programme. The UK was a top five collaborator for 25 out of the 27 other member states. And that is, that is saying quite something. Um, and collaboration with the UK has also been shown to increase the impact and influence uh, of EU science activity. So in so many ways, the UK has benefited hugely from membership um, and so has the rest of Europe as well. Now, like Switzerland, um, at least publicly, the UK continues to be committed to her, um, associating to Horizon Europe. And obviously, the, the, the ball is not in our court, but the European Commission's court at the moment. Um, but um, unlike Switzerland, and um, not entirely surprising, perhaps given the UK's history and also general policy preferences, we may be seeing a shift away from that kind of collaboration towards an idea of competition, or certainly competition with European partners. Um, in UK discourse, in fact, and I've been, you know, uh, sort of tracking that for quite some time, very often you see Europe as being set up something that's different from global. So if UK um, politicians talk about a uh, global Britain, they very often mean that bit of the globe that's not Europe. Um, whereas my argument around is, is always to say that's all very good and in fact also very necessary, yet um, can Europe please remain an important part of that? Um, the biggest hot potato here, of course, is Horizon and the, the, the research framework programs of the European Union. And the longer uncertainty remains, um, the more the weight is shifting towards what we call Plan B. So. Uh, as I said, the government obviously is committed to association, but it can't wait forever and it has to plan. And the more it's planning, the more interested people come and the, come in the ideas of what you could do if you were to design the whole thing from scratch. Um, and by their very existence, such alternative schemes would effectively be competing with Horizon Europe. Um, certainly also collaborating in some instances but even where they are going to be designed very differently, an element of competition will begin to seep in where collaboration tended to rule. And I think a particular case here is for the European Research Council. Um, at the moment, at UCL at least, practically all ERC grantees who were given the grants in this transition period have decided to stay at UCL, even should their grant no longer be funded by the ERC, but underwritten by UKRI. That actually is quite a big vote of confidence into the UK sector, but we don't know what the future would hold and what future um, applicants go down that route. So in order to attract the best and brightest, I think ERC, uh, which is the one model that the UK is likely to seek to replicate here, would by its very nature um, end up um, in competition with the ERC. And similarly, in the area of student mobility, so the Turing programme really welcome is a, is a really welcome investment in and also allows us a new experimental forms of student mobility. And we're very grateful also that that um, financial investment has now been um, extended for another three years, giving us some sort of uh, planning and um, stability. Um, it's also in line with UCL's really drastic ambition to um, have at least 30% of its undergraduates um, have some form of international experience um, as part of their degree. But of course, as most of you will know, the Turing programme also um, lacks the reciprocity required for mobility. 
So it requires a bilateral form of an agreement uh, with partners on, in Europe, underwritten, however, by only a unilateral um, funding commitment. And that's a really qualitative change in the way that we've perceived collaboration so far. Um, it also really remains to be seen how we are meant to um, honour uh, our existing commitments to students who go on their compulsory year abroad as part of that degree and which have previously been funded by Erasmus, and at the same time continue to develop new forms and diversify our partnerships for mobility. And while we're on Erasmus, um, a different lesson we're learning is from the European University um, Alliance's initiatives. Now, Many UK universities, including UCL, chose not to participate in one of those um, um, alliances when they were originally launched. Um, there's lots of reasons. Part of the reason may have been timing. Part of it may be the peculiarity of the higher education system here, which makes transferring credits from one UK institution to another already much of a headache. And um, try now that with um, several other universities in other countries. Um, but obviously also there was a part of skepticism towards the aims and ambitions of the original network and the long-term benefits um, of the scheme. Now, I'm not in the position to judge whether that decision was right or not. What I, the lesson I wanna draw from it is the experience that a significant level of institutional and also individual trust just builds up between higher education institutions forced to spend an inordinate amount of time working out just how different they are from each other and how best to overcome those differences and to um, establish a common project. Or um, to put it in different terms, uh, uh, there's a lot of sunk cost involved in creating long-term big partnerships of this kind um, that undoing them is inefficient, um, but also with financial and human resources being quite constrained, um, the capacity for additional collaborative schemes with partners who are not part of that alliance becomes more costly and also much more difficult. So um, outside of both Erasmus and, and Horizon and these networks for UK universities, um, partnerships with, um, uh, 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 with higher education institutions outside Europe may well increase um, over time. But I think it's also worth stressing that um, the governments worldwide really are adopting a more politicized approach to science and technology and research policy. Some maybe with a more protectionist approach to international um, collaboration uh, amid concerns, for example, around intellectual property or academic freedom. And so navigating those partnerships um, with other countries some of them have with very different um, political systems and values, you know, has become a real focus for, um, for our policymakers, so within Europe and, and abroad. And as we are, I think, all too aware, we've had two of the biggest exogenous shocks um, uh, really to have hit the, our sector as it's hit pretty much all of politics and society. Um, um, which are having a really long-term impact on the future of our global engagement strategies. And one is, of course, the lessons that we can learn from the pandemic um, about how and what we can um, teach to our students, how important in-person versus virtual forms of mobility are, and what the limits and opportunities are to virtually conducted um, uh, research. So we've had a massive learning curve um, in these areas that will change the way we cooperate um, and compete. Second, of course, the Russian invasion of, the UK, of Ukraine, which has also made um, universities in Europe and beyond both sever at incredibly immense speed, very long standing ties with um, partners in the Russian Federation, and um, at equally immense speed, conceive of new schemes um, that host displaced students and scholars, twin with Ukrainian uh, universities, or otherwise offer uh, support um, as best they can. I really hope that the crisis response mode, which seems to have governed university international uh, priorities for the past five years, do come to an end at some stage. Um, but that means we look forward um, more strategically speaking, and, and we have to ask ourselves what that future might look like. So um, with a final note to that, to say that I think particularly from a UK perspective, it is and remains important to affirm the importance of intra-European collaboration 
as well as understand from a pragmatic point of view that it's really through collaboration, through economies of scale, and really um, truly multilateral approach um, that European science will remain competitive also in, in the face of, of, of obviously ever bigger competition, for example, from Southeast Asia. Um, my hunch is that bilateral initiatives, which we've established over time, um, really will see themselves strengthened certainly in the midterm as we await further developments on European and also domestic um, uh, collaboration funding. So examples from UCLs and partners across Europe include things like Alliance for Tech, which was a European campus without borders that we had with, have with Central Suchlec in Paris, uh, Politecnico di Milano and um, TU Berlin, um, and which preceded by a long shot the university networks. The really wonderful um, collaboration that's beginning to take place with the INRIA London program, for example, um, the um, dual degree we have with Sium Spool in European Social and Political Thought, or a Max Planck UCL Center for Computational Psychology. I could go on, um, which I wouldn't, you'll be glad to know. Um, but I think important in the context is that um, those strategies, which are independent in principle of multilateral funding, have become vehicles for us uh, in order to deepen and and, and really enhance strategic cooperation with individual institutions that would sort of safeguard us from a wider um, political environment at the same time as just promising um, a very, very focused uh, collaboration over the years. I also want to mention that we devised a program at UCL that um, wanted to spend um, prompt prime funding for bilateral research and teaching um, initiatives but with a wide web of regional stakeholders um, and through what we call the Cities Partnerships Program, um, and which is piloted with Rome, Paris and Stockholm. So we've tried to innovate a form of uh, both bilateral and yet somehow network regional cooperation that would allow us to increase a narrowed focus, um, but across faculties and disciplines in a particular uh, region in Europe. Best practices of this kind are obviously driven at institutional levels and are different from the sort of systemic um, and transnational arrangements that we've discussed before. But we have to work through a sector a level um, network such as LIRU and the um, European Universities Association to make the case continuously to both our national governments, but also to the EU for why intercollaboration, international collaboration matters, and also to negotiate at the same time new bilateral arrangements that allow us to, um, those, to, for those bilateral relationships to continue in the event of non-association. So we drive a sort of parallel um, card, if you like. Um, I think I'm probably well over time now, but I think what I just wanted to, uh, to end with is that we think, I think it's important that we both um, hope that EU science and research policy continues to evolve in a global and outward facing direction that maintains a strong emphasis on excellence and blue sky um, research funding on innovation and teaching and research, possibly above and beyond, but that's my personal view, identity and value based considerations, just as we must hope at the same time that the UK government becomes more willing over time to engage with EU-led innovations in a less politicized manner and, and see them as part of the global visions that they, um, that they um, represent. As someone who's taught and published on European integration matters, I think I do understand the difficulties of the trust uh, that is being breached around the protocol and why that leads to um, a, a holdup in the association. Um, I understand also what uh, Professor Inderez now said about um, the importance of universities um, helping build uh, a European consciousness. And yet at the same time, I, want, I worry about that difference between shaping and building a political community. And what would it look like if all of a sudden UKRI turned around and told us in our collaboration that we should think particularly about building a future UK um, policy um, and identity. Uh, those sort of worries um, have played up in Brexit. I remember very clearly the time when a, a Tory MP shortly after the referendum wrote to all universities asking to see our syllabus where we're teaching EU matters and Brexit matters. Um, 
that was rebuffed, but it was a sign of political encroachment, perhaps, on the task of universities um, that should remain separate. But that is an, 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 an area for, for discussion, and um, I shall leave it at that at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to move us on in about 20 minutes to open discussion and, and questions and answers. So, so do think about uh, questions that you might want to pose to our panelists from now onwards. But before I do that, uh, we're very fortunate to have two um, leading academic experts in the field of our education and research, uh, both Professor Christine Musella and Dr. Vincent Carpentier here with us. Um, I'm going to ask them each to uh, provide sort of 10 minutes worth of reflections on the basis of the keynotes that we've just heard. Um, professor Christine Mustafa, if you'd like to go first, uh, you're a CNRS uh, full research professor and lecturer at Sciences Po, Sciences Po de Sociologie des Organisations. Uh, your research focuses on universities with a particular interest in what characterizes their governance um, and uh, various French government initiatives, including excellence initiatives. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you also for the invitation to participate to this. Uh, Panel. Uh, maybe there are some points I would like to just put on the table in order to develop the conversation. Uh, we heard about a lot about cooperation, uh, but not so much about competition in uh, the previous, uh, even if you put much more competition maybe than Anna in your, in your talk. But I would like to come back to this idea of competition and uh, maybe stress uh, one or two points. The first one is that it's we observed for sure, an increase in competition in the last decades. And the drivers for this increase in competition is not something which is a natural phenomenon just popping up, you know. It's, uh, from my point of view, led by two main drivers. The first one are private actors, and I'm thinking of Google, of Google for instance, or at uh, uh, Web of Science and, and so on, because we have much more data on academics, we can provide indicators and rank uh, academics, labs, and institutions. And that's something which really developed in the last decade. And one of the results for that has been that institutions which were not so much in competition before are more and more in competition one with another. So I would say that nations and academics have been used to competition for a long time, but institutions are really behaving as competitors not so for so many time now. And that's one thing I wanted to, to stress because we, we, speak, we spoke a lot about institutions here, uh, much more than about academics themselves or uh, nations. And I will come back to this point. Uh, the second drivers for this increase in competitions are governments. They develop a lot of instruments in order to increase competition among academics, among institutions, among the research labs. And uh, this competition is much more equipped than it was before. And the, the results of this competition are much more visible. And this also increased the level of competition and the sense of competition. And I think that's something that, to, that has to be in our mind. Uh, but this competition also created more cooperation and that's, something which is always going one with another. There is no competition without some forms of sociability and the, uh, the very well-known uh, sociologist Georg Zimmer showed that many, many years ago. Uh, if you want to compete, you have to know your competitors and so you have to develop social relations with them too. And you can see that again through different mechanisms. And one of them is what I call elective alliances. For me, the Russell Group is a perfect example for mm -hmm. that. Uh, U15 in Germany or the UDIS in France, which is the, the, the network of the excellent French universities. Or at the EU level, you have the Les Roux, uh, but of course the Guild uh, and many others. And here, it's a very interesting process through which institutions considering themselves as LinkedIn institutions, if you go on the websites of these alliances, you can always find the word leading institution. You know, that's a, well, uh, so they consider themselves as leading institutions, so they bring themselves together. And what are they doing? They're not really cooperating, they are lobbying. 
uh, they develop information, they exchange expo inf information. Um, they also provide uh, advices or they say what they would like higher education to be. And they are quite important, I would say, in many countries and they are more and more present, I, I would say. That's something which is really based on self-election. You know, you, 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 you decide that you are part of it and it's really status and reputation based. Along that, you have also public policies aiming at developing cooperation within higher education. We had it in France with the, uh, what we called, there were many words, let's take the last one, which was commu. Uh, the commu were consortium of universities uh, getting together because they were on the same territory and trying to develop cooperation. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, one experience. You have you have also that in uh, in Germany uh, for the last uh, excellence initiative. It was possible for alliances. That it's always the term the same term, you know, alliances, but it doesn't mean all the time the same thing. But that was also called, uh, called alliances in Germany. They could apply for the excellence uh, program, the excellence strategy in Germany. Uh, but you also see that at the EU level, uh, you. We could see it uh, through the research programs uh, because uh, with the collaborative projects, we, you are asked to put many different research teams together in order to develop the, a research program. And you can see it also, I think, from with the uh, European universities alliances. Uh, again, you have a kind of a political will uh, to bring together academics or institutions and to ask them to cooperate. I must say that I'm quite um, skeptical about <laughs> this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, policies uh, because they are of course based on bottom-up initiative in the sense that you're not obliged to uh, cooperate with someone. But as you mentioned uh, Uta in your speech, uh, there is a lot of cost uh, of transitional cost, uh, cost of transactions in this kind of, uh, of um, settings. And something which has not been really discussed up to now is also how do you govern this kind of structure? Uh, who is responsible for it? How do you make decisions together? Uh, the rationals behind that are also to be questioned, I think, uh, because as you mentioned in research, there are many potential cooperation. And how do you manage specific cooperation within this kind of structure with the natural cooperation that you want to develop as an academic? So here there is a kind of tension too that should be uh, also mentioned. So a lot of more competition, but also new forms of cooperation. Some of them really coming really from bottom up. And I, I, here I think of the many mergers we had in France and uh, Alain could speak of uh, his experience uh, and his role in, the, uh, in the developing this kind of merger in France, but also this kind of policy made cooperation, which probably have to be discussed and to be uh, questioned. And uh, another thing I would like to, to stress is whether this kind of cooperation can really help building a European research area or a European higher education area. And here I have some doubt because I think it doesn't tackle the main problem we have in building this kind of area. We try to do it for so many years now without the UK now, I'm sorry about that, but uh, nevertheless, it remains a big issue in, in Europe. And I think that one of the reasons why we, there are many reasons, that's one of them is again competition. When I look at the policies developed by the different European, the European countries, they are always trying to become the best in the world competition. Mm -hmm. The reforms which are led, they are never led with the idea of building Europe or European, uh, a European research area or a European higher education area. They are always led in order to be the best in the world. That's what I hear in France when we developed the PIA, the Programme d'Initiative 
je ne sais plus ce que veut dire le, le PIA, uh, or in Germany when they develop the excellence initiative, uh, the, the aim is not Europe. And I think that something that should be really much more on the table, how can we bring together our different systems? And if I can have two more minutes, I think that one important way to develop more cooperation within Europe will really be to uh, modify our management of academic careers and to much more harmonize, if I can use this word, the different systems so that we consider that, so that academics consider that the normal space in which they develop is Europe and not only their national uh, country. Uh, a last word about internationalization and what will happen uh, with internationalization with the recent uh, new geopolitics we are facing right now. I'm not sure that much will change because as you mentioned, most of the relationships in terms of research, and I was attending a conference on internationalization of research uh, two weeks ago in Sweden, they showed that the main relationships are between the US or let's say North America, UK, France, Germany, let's say Europe. And it's true that science is much more polycentric than it has been in the past. And we can see it on many indicators. But nevertheless, the main bulk of the relationships are still there. So I'm not sure these relationships will be really threatened. But what might happen would be that uh, other centers will develop and develop isolated from Europe or from the, from the US so that we could have much more uh, different circles of, uh, of cooperation in the world. And I won't, as I said, I'm not sure that it will change something for the European, but that there would be much more changes in other parts of the world with new forms of relationships from which we will be more excluded than we are now. But uh, yeah, that's for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Last but not, not least, uh, Dr. Vincent Carpentier, who's reader in history of education at the IRE UCL's Faculty of Education and Society. Thank you. And thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, it was a pleasure to, uh, to discuss uh, this very important topic with you. So I just wanted to, to make like a few points in, uh, in relation to uh, what the previous speaker has been said. And, uh, you know, I, I think I will like make some. Uh, you know, connection with some key ideas, which I think uh, have been the idea of a political role of university. I always say university and higher education institution. I mean, I guess we say university, uh, uh, but uh, you know, it's uh, um, we can see a broader term as well in building identity, national identity, and European identity. In that case, uh, as uh, uh, Alain Beretz uh, noted in this in this presentation, the other thing that I can you know I get from uh, I would say most presentation is the, the idea that structures mat matter in a way. And uh, uh, that's idea that, you know, in the case of Brexit, like we just discussed that, you have to reconstruct like, some kind of uh, structure that will uh, have an impact on, on, on the practices and the policies and what you do. And, and this idea of uh, whether you go towards like a movement of uh, cooperation or competition mm -hmm. as well. So this tension between the two for me uh, is important. I think, uh, as Christine said, I mean, and I think HE is, competition is part of HE, uh, you know, in some way of research, uh, but cooperation is a very, uh, is a very key, I think one can't work without the others. Um, or with, you know, uh, if it's not the case, there would be like some potential uh, uh, negative implications in relation to that. So I just want to make like a few points because I'm, that's my probably historical lens and, uh, you know, um, talking about the Franco-Prussian war, uh, you know, all this like this key, this key idea and turning point. And, you know, I was thinking about the title of, uh, of this, uh, of this event and the idea of crisis, which I, I researched quite a lot in some ways. So I, I got inspired by that, which is a bit probably sad, but, uh, uh that's, uh, I was thinking first that it is a key crisis at the moment. We've got like some uh, 
uh, uh, really interrelated uh, challenges at the economic, political, social, and geopolitical levels that uh, are very important. And I have two points in relation to that is, first, there's been crisis before. Um, for example, I, uh, you know, I study Kondratiev cycles, which are like economic cycles, and you, you had like some huge like turmoil in the world in Europe in the 1830s, 1870s. 1930s, we know it, and 1970s, and 2008 more recently, and all of them had a huge impact on higher education, uh, you know, in some ways, and led to uh, some uh, important reform and some questioning about this idea of collaboration or, or competition in some ways. Uh, the point I would like to make in relation to that is, I think this crisis is really critical uh, for a number of reasons, and. Uh, I co-edited a book with Elaine Unterhalter, who is a professor at UCL as well. On, uh, in 2010, we, start writing, uh, we started writing it in uh, 2008, so in the middle of the financial crisis, and uh, uh, we developed this idea of higher education, or the world in, uh, being in the middle of a tetralemma, which is four like forces uh, that we need to pull together in some ways. That was the economy in some way, equity and inequality, the third was uh, sustainability, and uh, uh, the other one was democracy. And the question there was like, how do you pull together these kind of forces that can be, uh, you know, and sometimes uh, competing in some ways? And uh, my point in relation to that, emphasizing the needs for cooperation, uh, is clear because we are at a critical point where all these forces, twelve years after, are you know, have been like uh, increasingly challenged, you know, environment, uh, geopolitical tension, democracy, uh, inequality, and, st and still an economic uh, fragile system. So uh, the environment represents an existential threat as well, that makes us think that we need to think about uh, really developing this, this collaboration in some way. But we probably need to change as well, probably the way we, uh, uh, we balance cooperation and uh, competition in some ways. COVID-19 opened uh, some kind of opportunities, maybe to reflect on these kind of changes in some ways. Uh, I think it's, it has shown the key role of higher education, um, you know, in terms of uh, responding to global challenge, but also the need for cooperation at the same time. But at the same time, higher education has been like heavily criticized uh, Sometimes, so there is a kind of uh, uh, that's my response to the idea of crisis and we are making it, and we need to do that uh, now. And so, uh, that's a difference between probably the 1870s uh, and late and, and period. The, the other point I would like to make, and I would uh, stop there, is in relation to this competition cooperation kind of uh, dynamics. Uh, there's two things, uh, according to me, and uh, I mean, there's more things, but two things came to my mind after the, the presentation is first, we need kind of like cooperation and collaboration between globally engaged institutions uh, that think about their respective HE systems as well. So that's the question of differentiation within each system as well. And I mm -hmm. think collaboration should be based on this kind of uh, uh, adequation because the global, the national and the local in that sense. And that's what like 2008 revealed and the backlash against higher education uh, uh, provoked in some way. So uh, I think that's one of the important things that academic collaboration should be uh, about developing Europe, developing global cosmopolitan society, let's say, but also to think about how uh, you could, through this uh, collaboration, um, transform the differentiation of higher education system nationally uh, in a good direction in some ways. So that means, I think the European un uh, universities have um, addressed that by talking about um, uh, inclusivity and the idea that students should uh, you know, reflect uh, uh, their population. There's maybe some way as well to think about how this collaboration can uh, integrate like different kinds of institutions at different, uh, you know, in different level in the hierarchy as well. Uh, the second point, which is linked to that one, is I think, and uh, uh, Alain Barrett, I mean, think talked about that, but the idea of resources, uh, there is a need to revive public funding um, uh, at national level and institutional level as well, in order to 
you know, address the textual I was talking about, but also to make sure that the, you know, this collaboration uh, leads uh, to this idea of uh, social justice I just mentioned. I'm going to stop now. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've got 20 minutes now until uh, we close, so an ample opportunity for questions, comments, um, uh, and discussion with the audience, both in person and remotely. Um, just a reminder, do pose your questions on the Q&A function if you're joining us remotely, as the chat won't be monitored. Um, uh, and uh, we've got roving mics here today, so, so please do uh, use that. Tell us who you are, where you come from, uh, and uh, if your question is addressed to anybody, first of all, gentlemen up here. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Anselm Heinrich. I'm Professor of Theatre Studies and International Dean at the College of Arts at the University of Glasgow. Uh, Uta, you've, you've been very cautious, uh, I thought, in your uh, introduction there, and almost sounded like a politician uh, in terms of being... Um, quite uh, careful not to criticize the UK government. For me, this touring scheme is imperial. Uh, this idea of we send you our students, but we are not taking your students. I think this is a, a huge mistake and a catastrophe, really. Um, so I just wanted to say, this is just a comment or a question, but I thought it was um, something you may, you may be thinking, but you were not saying. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> Please. <laughs> so, yeah. I try and make I try and make an, an actual point in my answer rather than say yes or no to this. Um, we may all have different preferences of what of where where political decisions had gone in the last few years, but we're also at the same time working with political reality. So there is a there's a huge issue in Turing around the lack of mobility, uh, the reciprocal mobility. That's the biggest single biggest thing. Um, and we made that point to base. We made that point. Um, uh, several times with several interlocutors. Um, but I have to say at least there's something because um, at a time of, of restricted um, funding and a lot of competition funding pots, this government has at least pledged an increase in science and research budget and also has put money towards it. So I'm careful indeed about, uh, because things could have gone very differently. What I hope we can do is, is make the case and also show empirically what it means that the, the goals they have set themselves, which is particularly goals of widening participation, where language is no longer one of the big language learning no longer one of the biggest um, issues. It's not about placement of engaging with other um, other nations abroad that it won't actually probably lead to the fulfillment of those capacities if you don't bring in the reciprocal element that's 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 one thing and uh, the other is the hope that over time that sort of policy sensitivity we've got at the moment that everything that's related with europe is by necessity political and not to be touched with the barge pole and you know because obviously everybody speaking on behalf of europe must by definition be a remoter and um, you can imagine with my triple uh, triple Europe and my triple job title, that's been an interesting experience. I do want to show that I also understand the constraints people are under who now occupy those positions in the sense that we need to engage with governance structures. Doesn't mean that we um, hold back when we think it needs vast improvement. Um, but I shall look at that, I think. <laughs> Um, I have a question for you, Christine, because you you have been quite challenging in your in your talk about um, building the uh, European era that is uh, well. I think we are more or less the same generation, and this was very important at the beginning of our careers. That was really the goal, and now you're right. We don't hear about it anymore, not as much as we, we did in the past. And I'm interested in what you said about having uh, um, European careers. I think that many of us have international backgrounds. You mentioned four languages, etc. But after spending some time abroad, when you come back to your country, you see that everything about your career happens in your country, the awards, the, the uh, um, yeah. And when you go away, people just forget about you. And uh, when you come back, you have no room for you. There is no room for you anymore. So this is something that 
probably people like us who are in charge could try to, to, to change, but it's not that easy. And uh, also, um, I think that um, having these careers, uh, in a way, we, we, we have to try bringing back to our countries these ideas of having another culture, seeing things differently. And uh, because we, of course, have a lot of information when getting together with other um, academics from other countries, even though we have a common ground in terms of our topics, we have different approaches. Of course, in Europe, maybe we are closer, but with UK, I'm sure we have different ways of, of, of uh, approaching the uh, problems, even for scientific or research problems. So I think it's a, a beginning of something. It, it's, we are not very far. And uh, I think that all we have built, including the networks of uh, um, national uh, Russell groups or whatever, is also a, a way to attract people to our country. I mean, uh, the IDEX uh, things, etc., cetera, uh, is more to attract foreigners to, to France, for instance, than to open our universities to, to, mm -hmm. to international broad, I would say. Mm -hmm. So there's still quite a lot to do. I think that's really an important point uh, about careers in, in Europe. And that's probably, for me, the main difference with, uh, with the United States. Of course, there is the languages. That's a main issue. Uh, they don't have this problem in the US. But if you look at the US system, in fact, you have as many systems as states. But nevertheless, the US academic system is all over the USA. So if you can apply at Harvard or at Berkeley or at uh, uh, UCLA, and that would be about the same rules for the same discipline because the academic uh, profession and the discipline uh, associations are very important in building the common norms for a single discipline. And we don't have that in Europe, I would say. We are, we are not sharing exactly from one country to another the same uh, sense of what science is, what uh, the norms are, and this is still to be to be built. Mm -hmm. And again, when I look at the way our countries are thinking, when I look at the recent reform in France with the LPR, the mm -hmm. Euro, the, the, uh, the research act, the recent research act, there is many things about careers in this act, and every, all of that is as if nobody had looked at what was going on in Europe <laughs> in order to try to, maybe not to copy because uh, we don't have to imitate, but at least to make things compatible. And I'm not sure that what has been made is understandable, under, understandable sorry, uh, by someone coming from another European country. And that's what I mean by looking at the different career systems and trying to make them more compatible one with another, not the same. I think that would be for a very, very long time. And I'm not sure that's uh, very useful, but at least compatible. And they are still not very compatible. And that's the reason why when you go abroad and you come back, you're, you're not in your system any longer because uh, you, you spend too much, uh, too many years uh, abroad and the system, the rules, the procedures are so different from one country to another. Still now, I think it makes the European, the, the feeling of being an, a European academic. And from my point of view, that would be really the goal to achieve so that each academic in Europe will feel an, an European academic and not first a French or a UK or a German academic. That's something that should be really uh, worked upon by the different countries in order to try to improve that. And I think that would be much more powerful in terms of building something European than just putting institutions together. Because I think that a university, which is not part of a European alliance like UCL, could feel very European and could uh, have European diploma and have a European spirit without being part of a larger cooperation. So that's, yeah. I was interesting, uh, interested by what Alain said about uh, what, mean, what European means uh, with these uh, European universities, because that's something which is very important. What is the added value? And that will be, that's a challenge for them, for, the, for, for these universities, right? Let's see what they add. That's, yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. I want to just uh, bring in somebody from the Q&A who's joining us remotely, Marina uh, Pagliarello from UCL, um, who, who's got a question about the EUI alliances and private actors specifically. Um, and she asked, do you foresee specifically to Professor Behetz now, uh, the EUI um, developing a common governance role for private actors with reference to service to society or innovation? And if yes, what type of role in terms of cooperation and competition? Thank you. Thank you, Marina, for the question. It's, it's not an easy question, but it relates more or less to what um, we heard before about careers. The, the issue is what tools do you have and not, I mean, don't, don't mistake the tools and the goals because that's, that's the big mistake that everybody is doing. And that I heard some mistakes in this table today, again, uh, specifically to answer, the, um, to answer this question. Um, I, just to, as a background, I've been six years vice president of my university dealing with relationship with the economy. So I'm quite in favor of that and I'm, I have a good experience. I must say, however, I don't see, but this is both in my individual university and in, um, in a European university, I don't see the issue of having uh, the industry or the economy generally in the governance of the university. A university is an academic body. I mean, let's go back to the fundamentals and uh, uh, you have to be associated, you have to involve, you have to listen, you have to relate whatever, verbs you want to use. But I mean, do you want an industrialist as the dean of a, of a faculty or as your president? I'm turning back the question. Uh, more specifically, this issue, the question you're asking is asked to any individual university in any country with differences in culture, differences in tradition and differences in regulations. And I've come back to the issue, what is the value added of this relationship on the European scale, considering what uh, uh, we just heard about the difference in, in, in regulations, which are very high in this, in this domain, also between the countries. So that's very interesting. Could a European university come out with a solution of international collaboration on that field that could not be achieved by individual countries? That would be very interesting. But that for this, you have to trust the uh, the universities, and it really depends of their uh, of their scope. You have some alliances which are very, I would say, very um, specific in one or several uh, economic domains. They will tailor made, I would say, their uh, their uh, relation according to those domains, uh, and some others are multidisciplinary comprehensive universities. So typically it will not be the same. So a very good question. I did, uh, of course, I did not answer the question, but my, my, main, my main answer would be really a European value added. Otherwise you come back to your national problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Hello, uh, thank you everyone. I'm from Embassy of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So uh, I thought my voice should be heard today because this is a very important theme and all of you really raised very good points. Uh, thank you for optimism. Thank you for skepticism. Uh, it's uh, always very, uh, from my point of view, uh, 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 very uh, important and very true, both that we need international collaboration uh, my country is a study case in the world for a reason. Uh, academics from our region started that war. They designed it, so academics are crucial. Uh, I, my opinion is that academics really are not uh, the force that have this uh, power to be superior above it all, but they need to intervene into this world, not just Europe, but they should be here to really save the world because that's, I think, the only possible way. And uh, as much as I heard today, I think we have power to do that. 
uh, I will be short. This is mostly what I want to say. I could say much more, but with everything that is going on, uh, I really think that if we connect these identities and values and, and this uh, shared goals in a way, because we have the, share, the same goal, <laughs> sorry, to have peace in the world and to have uh, normal conditions to function in this continent and through the world, I think only with joint forces, with joint voices, with uh, sharing the same goal, with this collaboration instead of competition, we can be there. Uh, at the, these uh, dialogues and conversation and connecting countries is the only way. And thank you all for being here and bringing hope back. Thank you very much. Um, we are approaching the end of the session. So if there are another, no other burning questions from the audience, um, I'd like to just invite um, each of our speakers to offer some closing reflections and perhaps just throw in a, a question of my own, which is we've rather taken as a given that everybody understands the value and importance of international cooperation. Um, and although I think policymakers uh, generally uh, pay lip service to international cooperation, we've also seen lots of barriers uh, surmounted uh, in, in recent years, particularly in the UK, one might say. Um, so I suppose uh, one question uh, which I would be interested in your reflections on is are universities in, on an individual basis through their networks, through their representative bodies, doing enough to articulate the value of international cooperation on a long term basis? Uh, perhaps we tell us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm getting the easy questions today. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really interesting um consideration that i i was only about a year or so ago i was in um in a meeting which my university's response to brexit and the mitigation planning that we put in place was subject of discussion um and overall i think um ucl put a lot of effort into mitigation planning and we had a lot of conversations around the country and interviews to try, try and ascertain what went well and what didn't go quite as well. But in that discussion, um, basically what, one question that was put forward was to say universities have been complete outliers in that they haven't really taken account of the public um, opinion which is all in favour of Brexit and um, by being so extremely um, on the pro uh, on the pro remain side they have to some extent made themselves difficult partners to engage with for governments um, and um, they should find a new basis on which to engage with partners. Um, the reason I'm saying this is that I think um, Sometimes the paradox is that by articulating so vociferously why international collaboration is important for us and why we need to continue to engage um, was for a while um, perhaps even considered too old school um, in the sense that um, apparently society had moved on and went, wanted to do a different kind of collaboration, which doesn't necessarily exclude international collaboration, but it has to be done in a different manner and in, 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 in a different voice. I think over these years, we've learned quite a lot. And go, going back to what I started with, I just wanted to say that the universities, I think, have tried to make it their voices heard very much, even in a climate where they were not necessarily be looked at as representative of public opinion. Um, and I wonder whether we um, have been able to, to do this without um, clearly trying to show that we don't, we're not open to change. I think what I'm trying to say is um, there is a lot of change happening and we can do both. We can hold fast to the things we do truly believe in and international collaboration with Europe is one thing, while at the same time experimenting um, with new forms. And I, um, I think that in this country, that is where the big challenge lies. It is in, at the moment a country which supposedly is very pro-research and pro-science, um, but I don't think it is one that entirely gets the international element of it um 
the way that I would like to see it defined. Um, and I think there's still a huge amount of nuanced discussion that we that we have to make and in which we both engage with those who, who make those decisions pragmatically and at the same time without compromising our own principles. That's very high level. I don't think you can derive any practical value from that, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Professor De Hetz, in closing reflections. Well, thank you. It's very complicated to do, to commit any closing reflections at that level of discussion. I, I would say, uh, because we, we had this network, I really want to come back maybe to my basic feelings is that, uh, of course, universities can be wrong. They're always wrong, in fact, because we learn by trial and error. I mean, the universities are not factories of truth. We work by trial and error, but we're the only ones. And when we hear all our member states, our Europe, telling us the truth before they even demonstrate it, I think the universities are right. Uh, that's the method. We have to convince our society, our fellow citizens, that our method is good. You just, Uta, you just spoke about this trauma of, of uh, Brexit, and I wouldn't teach uh, the slightest lesson to my colleagues of the UK about this. It's so complicated. I witnessed it when I was uh, chair of Leru, and we were discussing with the vice uh, chancellor of, of Cambridge, of Oxford, and, all, and what they were doing. And I mean, it was a drama for them, and I think they were right. I, I, as a, an academic, if tomorrow uh, we we avoided some very tragic governments in France, for, but uh, if we ever get this type of government, uh, the universities will be sacrificed. And so we 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 have we have an issue on that. I think the universities are not the, the international. And to come back to your question on international. Uh, Again, what I wanted to say by my little historical loop is that it's in our nature. We don't have to build an international policy. We are international. Mm -hmm. We are supported by our countries and we love our countries, but we are international. We are plural by nation and we are plural also by disciplines. And this is something that maybe we have, I'm sorry to say, to teach to our politicians sometimes that don't, that just don't understand it, depending on the country. But the trust invested in universities is, is very different. Even in Europe, I, I, I have a mixed feeling for Europe and I have a mix for France. Uh, uh, of course, Christine, I, I, I join you on, on, your, on your comments. But when you see, for example, Luxembourg or Singapore, what they decided to do with their universities. There are lessons to be taught and they're doing it, of course, internationally. They're building from scratch. And how are they building their university? On an international standards with international personnel and international students. So I guess we are, it's our genes. And, uh, but what we heard today, I'm always an optimist. I think we have a lot of mistakes. We have a lot of problems. We have a lot of issues to tackle, but I think if we, it's still in universities that think things are really moving. And the, again, uh, you will hear tomorrow, but I was so surprised by the enthusiasm of the, of the people that wanted to apply for a university, uh, European University Alliance. And I'm very critical on the scheme, by the way, very, very critical on the scheme, but the enthusiasm was totally non-proportional to the amount of money given to the, to the issues uh, and, and so this means something. It means that people want Europe, they want international uh, relations. I think that's something that makes me also, in a way, optimistic. But thank you again for organiz organizing this meeting and it was really fruitful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine Vincent. Do you have any cl closing remarks before we wrap things up? A very, very short sentence. Uh, I completely agree that uh, universities are per se international and that they need internationalization. We just have to be careful about the fact that competition could lead to closure of this cooperation. And that's something we should be really uh, careful about. Great. Well, uh, I'm conscious we can go on for quite a lot longer than our allotted time. Did you want to come in? Or... No? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, I just uh, 
give the floor for uh, five minutes to Dr. Minha for any closing remarks. Uh, it will be less than that. I, I just want to react to what has been said. And uh, I, will, uh, I, I really uh, like the idea of uh, the difference between network and alliances and the idea of having added values, which without these added values, there is no, no, no need to cooperate in a way. And uh, I think that there is not a unique model and we have to remain creative. I think that it, even in the alliances, there are different types. There are targeting topics or, or methods, etc. I like also the idea that uh, we should not make a confusion between the objectives and the tools. I think objectives are needed, tools are only a, a mean, a way. And um, at the end, I would, I, I, I would like to come back to your comparison, Alain, between these uh, cooperation, these alliances of, of universities and the ERC program, which is, has been, which, has, which is for everybody a success, because it relies on trust and trust on the ideas of the uh, um, scientists themselves, the academics themselves. And this is my little message. We have to be confident in the ideas of the uh, scientists themselves, scientists, researchers, in the large sense. Perfect, thank you very much. So with that, thank you very much to all of our distinguished speakers. Um, thank you to you for coming and to those of you who joined us remotely. Uh, the recording will be available on our website in the coming days. Uh, thank you also to the UCL Faculty of Laws that made this hybrid event possible, which isn't always the easiest, um, uh, technically speaking. And, and I hope you'll agree it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you to you. Thank you.